Nuclear reactors are technological marvels. They produce radioisotopes for medical treatments, industrial and agricultural applications, and are one of the cleanest ways to generate vast amounts of electricity. But can a nuclear reactor explode like a nuclear bomb? Following Betteridge's law, the answer is no. A nuclear reactor cannot explode like a nuclear bomb, and in this video I will show you why. Nuclear power plants are high-tech kettles. They use the heat released by nuclear fission to boil water, generating steam, which in turn spins turbines to generate electricity. Uranium is packed into small fuel pellets. These pellets are put inside long rods, and many of these rods are bundled together in the form of fuel assemblies. The core of a conventional nuclear reactor can contain around 200 of these fuel assemblies for a total of around 75,000 kilograms of uranium. But don't worry, this is not like the uranium in a bomb, and that is a crucial difference. Keep in mind that there are many designs for nuclear reactors. In this video, I use the word reactor, referring to the standard commercial reactors that generate power today. When a neutron hits a uranium nuclei, there are three possible outcomes. Here I am showing U-235, but the same applies to U-238. The nucleus may split producing secondary neutrons. We use the Greek letter nu to denote the average number of secondary neutrons. The neutron can also be captured and absorbed by the nucleus without fissioning. In this case, the neutron is lost. Finally, the neutron can also just bounce. In this case, the neutron is not lost and it can hit another nucleus, so we will only focus on the first two scenarios. Each reaction is characterized by its cross-section that was introduced in the video about critical mass. As a reminder, the cross-section is a quantity that measures the probability that a given reaction can occur in terms of an area. There is a cross-section for fission and another cross-section for capture. The two relevant isotopes of uranium have their own cross-section and average secondary neutrons. Therefore, we have six relevant numbers, fission cross-section and capture cross-section for both U-238 and U-235, and their corresponding number of average secondary neutrons produced by fission. All these quantities are experimentally measured. Which of the two isotopes is more relevant depends on the values of these six quantities, but also on the abundance of each isotope. In natural uranium, the fraction of U-235 is just 0.7%. The process of increasing the fraction of U-235 in a lump of uranium is called enrichment. Weapons-grade material requires an enrichment fraction over 80%. The amount of enrichment or fraction of U-235 content is a crucial factor. To quantify its effect, let us imagine a lump of uranium with a fraction F of U-235 and the remaining fraction, 1 minus F, made of U-238. Now we shoot a neutron at this lump. The question that we need to answer is, how many secondary neutrons will this primary neutron produce on average? This average number of secondary neutrons is called criticality factor, or sometimes reproduction number, and is denoted by K. If K is less than 1, the chain reaction will quickly die off. In a reactor, this simply shuts the reactor down. In a bomb, K less than 1 leads to a failed explosion, orders of magnitude below the design yield. This is called a fizzle. If we want to trigger a nuclear chain reaction, we need a continuously increasing number of neutrons. Therefore, we need K greater than 1. Neutrons can hit a nucleus of U-235 or a nucleus of U-238 in the material. In each case, it can lead to fission and more neutrons, but they can also be captured and lost. These two reactions compete and we need to determine the average number of neutrons after the reaction which is given by the sum of neutrons produced by the fission of U-235 and U-238. The number of neutrons produced by the fission of U-235 is the average secondary neutrons per fission, that we call nu, times the probability of this fission. The same applies to U-238. The probability of fission can be calculated as the relative abundance 
times the ratio between the fission cross-section and the total cross-section. Remember that for U-235 the abundance is F and for U-238 is 1 minus F. The total cross-section, sigma total, for something to happen is given by the individual cross-sections for both fission and capture weighted by their relative abundance. Putting all this together, we obtain a general expression for the criticality factor as a function of the uranium enrichment F. This looks like a messy expression, but we know the values of all these quantities. Plug in the values from the previous table for fast neutrons, we obtain the following plot. The plot clearly shows that k greater than 1 requires at least an enrichment of 53%. For weapons-grade uranium, K is always above the critical value, and this is why a high concentration of U-235 is required for a bomb. A crucial result found in this plot is that for natural uranium, K equals 0.28. This means that a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction using fast neutrons in natural uranium or even in low and rich uranium, which is used in nuclear reactors, is physically impossible. A nuclear reactor just cannot explode as a nuclear bomb. Other types of explosions can still occur, for instance due to the build-up of gases, like it is believed it happened after the Chernobyl and Fukushima accidents. However, they were not nuclear explosions because fast neutron chain reactions are not possible with low and rich uranium using reactors. We have just demonstrated that fast neutrons cannot produce a self-sustaining chain reaction in natural uranium. Then the obvious question is, how can a reactor work? The answer is a counterintuitive trick. Slow the neutrons down. It turns out that when neutrons move slowly, they can be more effective at fission in U-235. It is tempting to think that the faster a neutron moves, the more violently it will hit the uranium nucleus and therefore more chances to fission it. However, the opposite is true. A slowly moving neutron that hits a nucleus will spend more time interacting and destabilizing the protons and neutrons in the nucleus, making it easier to produce nuclear fission. In fact, the fission cross-section for U-235 for slow neutrons is more than 400 times as high as the fission cross-section for fast neutrons. Once again, we have six parameters to add to our previous table, now for slow neutrons. Plugging these values in the general formula derived earlier, we find that the criticality factor looks very different. The curve increases rapidly for low values of F and quickly flattens to remain constant for higher values. Zooming in on the low values of F, we find that K is greater than 1 even for natural uranium. This result is what makes nuclear reactors possible. This is the calculation that Enrico Fermi in the US and Werner Heisenberg in Germany did and why they knew that a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction was possible with natural uranium. Since all the secondary neutrons produced by fission move very fast, all that was needed was a way to slow them down. The trick is to surround the uranium by a material containing atoms of low mass so that the fast neutrons can collide and bounce losing most of their kinetic energy in the same way as fast billiard balls move slowly after hitting other balls of similar mass. This type of material is called a moderator. The simplest choice is water, because it contains plenty of hydrogen, which has almost the same mass as a neutron. But hydrogen is also really good at absorbing neutrons, so it cannot be used. The next option is heavy water, made of oxygen and deuterium instead of hydrogen. This was the moderator of choice by scientists of the German nuclear program during World War II, which was a mistake that kept their nuclear reactor from achieving criticality. Heavy water works, but it is expensive to produce and a very slow process, so the Germans did not have enough heavy water during the war for their reactor. They didn't have enough uranium either. Fermi kept going up the periodic table and settled for carbon in the form of ultra-pure graphite. On December 2, 1942, his experimental reactor built under the viewing stands of the stadium at the University of Chicago went critical. For the first time in history, an artificial self-sustained chain reaction was generated. We have just shown that a nuclear chain reaction with natural uranium is possible, so you might wonder why not build a bomb with natural uranium and slow neutrons? 
This would avoid the need to enrich uranium saving millions of dollars and months of work, plus natural uranium is quite abundant. In fact, Robert Oppenheimer proposed this idea in 1939, however it was later shown that the yield of a bomb is inversely proportional to the square of the characteristic time between fissions. This is a quantity that was defined in the video about the physics of a nuclear explosion. When two quantities are inversely proportional, then their product is a constant. This means that the yield multiplied by the square of the characteristic time is equal to a number that does not depend on the speed of the neutrons. Therefore, we can mathematically relate the yield and the characteristic time for slow and fast neutrons in the following way. Solving for the yield of our slow neutron bomb, we find it to be equal to the yield of the equivalent bomb using fast neutrons times the square of the ratio between the characteristic times. In the video about the physics of a nuclear explosion, we found that this characteristic time is given by the fission mean free path divided by the speed of the neutron. So the ratio that we are trying to find becomes just the ratio between the speed of a slow neutrons and fast neutrons. The speed of slow and fast neutrons can be calculated from their energy, and plugging their values we find that the ratio that we are looking for is of the order of 10 to the minus 4. Plugging this back in the previous expression, we find that the yield of a slow neutron bomb differs from the equivalent bomb using fast neutrons by a factor of 10 to the minus 8. This means that the yield of a slow neutron bomb would be about 40 million times lower than the equivalent bomb using fast neutrons. Taking this comparison to Little Boy, the bomb drop on Hiroshima, instead of 15 kilotons of TNT, our hypothetical slow neutron bomb would release less energy than half a kilogram of TNT. This idea was finally put to test in 1953 during Operation Upshot Knot Hole. Two experiments were conducted which resulted in a fissile. The result was considered an embarrassment when most of the tower was standing after the explosion. Only the top was destroyed, mostly by the high explosives used to assemble the device. This is why bombs cannot be built using natural or low enriched uranium, and why a nuclear reactor cannot become a nuclear bomb. Fast neutrons simply cannot produce a chain reaction. Slow neutrons give the bomb core enough time to blow itself apart and therefore fail to properly detonate. Even when trying hard to make it explode, the uranium heats up and self-destroys before a chain reaction can produce enough energy for a nuclear explosion. This video was sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant is fun and interactive, with thousands of lessons from basics to advanced topics and new lessons added every month. Related to today's video, let me recommend the course Understanding Graphs. The content includes revealing patterns, optimization, and solving problems with graphs. Following fun stories and interactive lessons will help you master these concepts. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Get access to all the courses that Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days. Visit brilliant.org jk0 or click on the link in the description.